visual effects have advanced massively over time, from a mechanical masterpiece built in American Werewolf in London to modern day monsters created digitally. We are certainly getting used to the technology in this digital age, but is newer always better? I will be exploring the history and future of film effects, what they mean to the people making them and what you as an audience want from your films. Now, when we talk about special effects, it means effects that have been done in post-production on a computer digitally. In camera, visual or practical effects have been made and they are real. It's the difference between the stop motion Jabba the Hutt and the CGI version that was cheaper to make. Just watch what happens though when Han reaches the tail. This is because it was originally filmed with a man and the tail was added in afterwards. I'm going to start with a man called Georges Melias and a trip to the moon from 1902, 114 years ago. He was a director and a magician and most say developed the art of magical special effects. He uses trick photography, animation, matte paintings and miniature models to create this masterpiece. He also showed the same act performing with themselves. Now we may have seen this recently with the craze, but back then the scene had to be filmed twice. Then using an optical printer, reprint the two onto a negative, creating a composite. It was a very lengthy process and it seemed like magic to audiences. I also want to show you this scene where a miniature ship crashes into the moon. Does he look familiar? Everybody look at the moon. Everybody see in the moon. The moon is white, it's milky white. Everybody look at the moon. Oh, eh, I did a song. Moving on to 1924 with The Thief of Baghdad, directed by Raoul Walsh. The most iconic scene is the flying carpet at the end. Raoul took credit for the effects, claiming that he got the idea while watching construction workers on a crane being lifted by wires. But it was Coy Watson that made the effect happen, the same man responsible for giving us sugar glass. It took a steel plate, piano wires, a crane and 18 cameras filming all at once to achieve this. Let's jump ahead to the 30s and the release of King Kong in 1933. This stop motion monster had audiences terrified in thinking that they had actually captured a giant ape. No one in modern day would ever be so easily fooled. It's a rhino, isn't it? Yeah. Rhinoceros. Oh um, yeah, that's really cruel because he just sat with it acting like it's just nothing, yeah. It's messed up, but it just, and he looks proud. Bellend. How can you be proud of that? Hmm. Miniatures against matte paintings were also used. Disney time now and Snow White from 1937. This groundbreaking full-length animation was completely hand-drawn. Just think about how long it takes you to draw a stick man in a little notebook. Walt and his animators were inventing a new art form, making up the rules as they went along, defining the craft for generations to come. During the two years of production, more than 750 Disney artists used over 500 miles of paper to create more than 2 million drawings and sketches. Walt Disney had to remortgage his house to fund it since people didn't have a lot of faith in the film. Let's skip to something a little more familiar. Yes, Star Wars, Episode 4, A New Hope from 1977. Now, you may be surprised to know that the amount of special effects used in the original were minimal. They used a 3D CGI map, but the rest of the effects were practical. They used a model and a computer-handled camera for the trench run. Go motion, a form of stop motion using blurring techniques between frames to make it look smoother for the at-ats and a manimatronic for Jabba the Hutt, which was about three men stuck in a sweaty rubber suit making it move. It's thanks to these techniques that have made the film stand the test of time. Of course, when CGI improved, it didn't stop George Lucas from adding in some extra creatures. He did go a little CGI crazy. Personally, I think it brought the look of the film down, but hey, I'm just a consumer. It's definitely why they tried to create as many effects as possible they could in the new film to try and win back the trust of some of the fans.
on to the 80s. Now, this is probably the best decade for film. There are so many classics. The first film, not so much a classic for its storyline, but for its effects. An American werewolf in London features a scene where a man turns into a wolf. They used makeup, animatronics, and sound played a very important part. Let's compare this to the transformation in The Curse from 2005, 14 years later using CGI. I was getting there, but it didn't have quite the same effect. <laughs> One of my favourite TV shows utilises the old school makeup and animatronics. Being human decided to not use CGI but to create their werewolf. We had to find a fairly kind of economical, expedient way of doing the transformation. And so we decided that rather than kind of blow a load of budget on, um, on CGI, we decided we were going to for prosthetics. And I'm so glad that that was the the choice we made because there's something about it that just kind of adds to the character of the show. It's something that actually exists and so consequently for example when you've got uh, a scene um, in the woods at night you know just the light of the, the full moon and the way that the light actually falls on the prosthetics and falls on the, the, the jaw as it's coming out it looks real. So I go to a certain level then they move me out then they put these these heads in and it's bizarre because I'll be watching it back in the monster. I'll be like, is that me? Is that, I know that, oh, no, definitely not me because I can't push a jaw out of my face. But yeah, they're brilliant. They're so brilliant. It's so effective. It's really like, oh, when you're watching it. And what I love about it is it's old school puppetry. It's not CGI, it's proper hand built, every hair sewn on. And they just look great. The first digital composite shot was used in 1989 in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. They filmed several makeup transformations and then morphed the elements together digitally. I think the mesh of the two techniques works best to actually create something that looks realistic. That is, if you care about realism in films. I definitely think scenes of horror, in order to be fully immersive in the film, need to look real. Otherwise it's comical. This is probably why Paranormal Activity works so well. You don't actually see anything scary in the film and it's all in your head. The first major CGI character came from Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Remember the liquid cop that was really annoying and would not die? They used over 300 special effects shots that made up about 16 minutes of the film in running time. The CGI character for this worked, but we mere mortals have a hard time processing things on screen that we've never seen before in real life. I personally have never seen a morphing robot from the future, so I don't actually know what it looks like. I think they chose the best option for the film at the time. On to Jurassic Park 1993, it's the best year. They did use CGI in this film, but out of the 14 minutes of dinosaur footage in the film, only four of those were digital. The raptors used both. And this beastie right here is real. They made a giant robot puppet with moving jaws using a spring wench type thing under the car to make it flip. Also, the roar of the T-Rex comes from an elephant. Yes, elephants roar. Let's compare this quickly to Jurassic World. Now, you can see how far CGI has come. They did also use animatronics and use Jurassic Park's visual effects supervisor to work on the new film. 
stop motion was suggested for the first Jurassic Park film for the Raptors, but was beaten by CGI. Stop motion is now more of a novelty or used for certain effects, but it's not obsolete. The Nightmare Before Christmas uses stop motion to create a unique animation effect, the same one we enjoy in Wallace and Gromit. It took three years to complete, averaging around 60 seconds of footage per week. A lengthy process, but it's so worth it. They do still use stop motion in live action movies, but only to gain that more textured effect. We are now used to a more glossy coat that CGI and 4K gives. Scary Movie 2 uses it for the weed monster. And the new Star Wars film uses it for the chess pieces played on the ship. Star Wars The Force Awakens Episode 7 has just come out, but what you might not know is that they brought in the original creature master of the first three Star Wars films, Phil Tippett, to replicate the Dejaric hollow chest sequence for the new Star Wars film. Now, in some cases, CGI is better. It can be less costly or time consuming, but it really is dependent on the circumstance. Take Lord of the Rings, for instance. They used CGI where necessary, but the sets they built were phenomenal. They used clever filming techniques to make Frodo look small and Gandalf look tall, and they used mini doubles for some of the action shots. In The Hobbit, however, they couldn't repeat this. They had the problem of space in The Hobbit house and had to think about the 3D element. They had to shoot one of the scenes in stereo, with the dwarfs on one set sat down and Gandalf on the green screen set talking to no one. Ian McKellen did not like this. He said, this is not what I do for a living. I act with people, I can't act on my own. He found it so difficult he nearly quit the films. He did struggle through it and I'm very glad he did. So does this overuse of the green screen affect our films through the actors? Does the acting become flat or do the actors simply have to suck it up and adapt their style? If you can't tell the difference between a practical effect or CGI, does it matter how it was done? It certainly makes it more impressive when they make things, and without set designers and these practical builders, we would have no Harry Potter studios to visit, only a green screen box. I suppose audiences care about the outcome more than the method, though. But what about the people making them? Being able to create amazing effects from your computer certainly brings power to the people. You no longer need a large budget, or any budget at all, to make films. Not that you couldn't make films before, but it certainly is easier to watch YouTube tutorials on how to make a bullet wound in After Effects, rather than making a pressurised explosion pouch strapped to an actor. To really get inside the heads of the filmmakers, I attempted my own short effects movie. Using classic and post-production effects. Please excuse the crudeness of my cyclops, they are harder to make than you think.
I made this film using household items or things you can buy cheaply on Amazon. The stop motion was fun to do and although it takes a lot of time to do properly, it means that anyone can have a go at animation. I downloaded a free stop motion app on my iPad to demonstrate how easy it is to do on your own and that you don't need lots of money or fancy equipment. You can do it on any smartphone or you can take photos and run them together using any editing software. Adding in the monster with the green screen was a bit boring. There's nothing to react to, but I did get the effect I wanted in the end. My zombie makeup probably needed some more practice to achieve Walking Dead standard, but it was fun and easy to use. Liquid latex is amazing stuff. Some people even use PVA glue mixed with a little foundation. I found that with practice, these effects are not beyond our reach. But the future of film effects also relies on its audience. Filmmakers need to make films that you want to watch. There has also been an increase in practical effects recently in films, so I don't think that CGI will be taking over quite yet. But what do you think? You can complete the questionnaire below to help towards my final research.